not open your Bibles into Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And if you have not heard the message from last Sunday, I would encourage that you do so because today is the second part on the Pledge of Allegiance. I just simply entitle it, The Pledge, Its History, and Its Problems. And we begin by reading Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, who have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And certainly we're going to understand one application of verse 3 before we close today. Let me just simply review A few minutes of what I covered last Sunday. I simply said in the introduction that usually speaking, since most people have grown up with the pledge, uh, that our feathers are very easily and quickly ruffled when someone will not recite the pledge or at least would not stand reverently while the pledge is being recited. And I said that the average attitude is simply that Someone who would not do that is in the least unpatriotic and at the very most Marxist or communist. And then I also pointed out in my introduction that I hesitated tackling this subject only because it is controversial and I'm not trying to start a fight. I'm not trying to start a debate. I'm not trying to uh, uh, create problems, but I'm rather trying to resolve problems by showing you some Uh, reasoning and some rationalism and also some biblical common sense as well. Now, last week we covered two points. We first of all looked at the author of the pledge, and we discovered that Francis Bellamy was an ousted Baptist pastor. He was a Freemason, and above all, he was a socialist to the nth degree. He advocated a centralized government with autocratic power, and he wanted government to control all the means of production. That means government would either own and or control uh, land, labor, and capital. He was also the head of the Christian Socialist Society, and he taught that government schools were the key to establishing the socialistic utopia in America. So he was indeed the author of the pledge. And then secondly, we look at the aim, and very quickly, I'm going to tell you what he said when he began to contemplate writing the pledge. In August of 1892, he said, It began as an intensive communing with salient points of our national history from the Declaration of Independence onwards, with the making of the Constitution, with the meaning of the Civil War, with the aspiration of the people. Now note he said that when he sat down to write the pledge, he thought about not just simply uh, the national history, the Declaration, the Constitution, but he also thought about the meaning of the Civil War. And then he goes on and he says this, and I'm quoting his words, the true reason for allegiance to the flag is the republic for which it stands. And what does that vast thing, the republic, mean? It is the concise political word for the nation. The one nation that the Civil War was fought to prove. To make that one nation idea clear, we must specify that it is indivisible, as Webster and Lincoln used to repeat in their great speeches. So here he is saying once again, that his philosophy is the same as Abraham Lincoln, and is the same as Daniel Webster. And he says the republic to him is the concise political word for the nation. I'm going to explain that just a little bit later. But let me give you one other quote that I gave you last week, just to show you uh, his socialism. In his speech, The Meaning of four, Four Centuries, he was advocating a strong position for government schools, and he says this, We assemble here today that we too may exalt the free school or the government school that embodies the American principle of universal enlightenment and equality, the most characteristic product of our four centuries of American life. One institution more than any other has wrought out the achievements of the past and is today the most trusted for the future. Our fathers in their wisdom knew that the foundations of liberty, fraternity, and equality, the slogan of the French Revolution, must be universal education. 
The free school, therefore, was conceived as the cornerstone of the republic. Washington and Jefferson recognized that the education of citizens is not the prerogative of the church or of other private interests, that while religious training belongs to the church and while technical and higher culture may be given by private institutions, the training of citizens in the common knowledge and the common duties of citizenship belongs irrevocably to the state, end quote. Now, here's what he said very clearly, that the state has the right to educate the children. He said it is not the prerogative of the church, nor is it the prerogative of other private interests. And you ask yourself, who other would uh, private interests refer to other than the parents? It's the parents that have the private interest in the children. So he says that it's not the church that has the interest. It's not the parents who have the interest. It is the state. And so he was looking then at government schools as the way to bring up our children as good little statists. So his aim then was basically to elevate the state to the position of godhood, almost, in the fact that it controlled every aspect of our lives. Now, <clears throat> I told you that the pledge had gone through at least four revisions, and the pledge that we have today, or that we recite today, is codified in the United States Code, and uh, it did not basically even become recognized by Congress until 1942, and of course the phrase under God was not added until 1954. So today I want to come to the third point, the analysis, and let you and I try to analyze the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, before I begin analyzing the Pledge of Allegiance, I want to give you a quote from Dr. Clyde Wilson. Listen to what he says. He has a very excellent point. Dr. Clyde Wilson has graphically pointed out this simple fact. There were in antebellum America no loyalty oaths or pledges of allegiance to the flag of the nation. Freeborn American citizens would have considered such to be an insult to their patriotism as well as an invasion of the rights of their states. Americans did not pledge allegiance to the flag. They swore to uphold and defend the Constitution. The swearing having definite overtones of Christianity and the Anglo-American tradition unlike the secularistic imperial pledge of allegiance, end quote. Now you just stop and think about what Dr. Wilson has said. In antebellum south, before the War of Northern Aggression, there were no loyalty oaths. There were no pledges of allegiance. The only thing men swore to do was to uphold and to defend the Constitution. Now, with that in mind, I want you to follow with me as I try to analyze the pledge. And I'm going to take it a phrase or even a word at the time. And let's break it down and see what is actually being said when someone says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, let's take the first words, I pledge. Do you realize that a pledge is a promise or an oath of allegiance? A pledge is a promise or an oath of allegiance. Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, defines a pledge as a promise or an agreement by which one binds himself to do something or forbear doing something. Now, the word pledge is found 22 times in our Bible. It usually refers to something given temporarily as a promise for the performance of a duty or something that would be considered as collateral for a loan. In fact, if you'll look in your Bibles very quickly to Genesis 38, you will find where Judah used a pledge to commit fornication uh, with his daughter-in-law, he did not know that it was his daughter-in-law, but look in Genesis chapter 38, beginning there with verse 13. The Bible says this, and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way of Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown, 
and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the way? And they said, There is no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Well, I'm not preaching on this text today, but the point I'm trying to make is, she took his ring, she took his staff as a pledge, something that she was going to hold until he gave her the fulfillment of his promise, which was a young kid of the flock. Now, let me show you how important a pledge is. Many of you understand that the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It was a very prominent book. Our Lord and the disciples used it and quoted from it. And the word pledge used in Genesis chapter 38, and I want you to turn in your Bibles, to 2 Corinthians 1, and then Ephesians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22, and then Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to show you the word pledge that is used in Genesis chapter 38 is also used in the New Testament. Notice, if you would please, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and look, if you would please, at verse 22. Here we will find the word earnest. The Bible talks about Christ and our salvation, and the Bible says, who also hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, the word pledge and the word earnest are the same in the Greek. If you would look in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14. Ephesians 1 and verse 14. The Bible in referring to the Holy Spirit. In fact, look in the latter part of verse 13. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse 13, the latter part, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest or who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Now, those of us who have been regenerated and converted by the grace of God have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is our pledge. It is our guarantee that Jesus Christ is going to return and complete and finish our redemption in the sense that we will be ultimately glorified and live with Him. So that Holy Spirit is our pledge. Now, when Christ gave us the Holy Spirit, what was He doing? He was binding Himself to return and complete our salvation by saving us not only out of our sin and from the penalty of sin, but from the very presence of sin itself. So the Holy Spirit is our pledge. It's the guarantee That Jesus Christ is going to return. Now, when you pledge, when you say, I pledge, you are binding yourself. You are agreeing and promising something. And just like Christ promised to come back and redeem His own, so when you say, I pledge, you are now beginning to bind yourself to something. Let's go further. I pledge allegiance. Allegiance is the obligation of fidelity and obedience to a government in consideration for the protection that the government gives. Now, Webster goes further in defining allegiance, and he says this. 
He defines allegiance as the tie or obligation of a subject to his prince or government, the duty of fidelity to a king, government, or state. Now, let me just tell you, there is a difference between express allegiance and what you and I would call a natural allegiance. Express allegiance is that obligation which proceeds from an express promise or an oath of obligation. So when you say, I pledge allegiance, you are now expressing allegiance, you're expressing an oath, you're tying and binding yourself to something over and above and beyond natural allegiance. And as Webster is correct, if you're going to swap allegiance for protection, governmental protection, If you swap allegiance for governmental protection day, I can assure you, you're going to be the loser. It is our highest governmental officials who are declaring that we must give up our rights for protection. Is it not absolutely strange and mind-boggling that in the 21st century, with all the technological advances that we have, That our government cannot protect its own people without causing us to give up or lose or waive our rights. Isn't that absolutely amazing? You see, the truth of the matter is this. I'd rather have my rights in governmental protection. Thank you, I'll protect myself. The amazing thing is this. When Bellamy was writing the Pledge of Allegiance, and he chose the word pledge, I pledge allegiance. He did so very carefully and very deliberately. You know why? Because he knew that the word oath, or the phrase oath of allegiance, would be very distasteful and uncomfortable for Southerners. Let me tell you why. Because during and after the War of Northern Aggression, many Southerners were forced to take an oath of allegiance. They were either forced to take it or they would be shot. It would be that simple. Here is an oath, or at least a portion of the oath, that Abraham Lincoln recommended. Here it is. I blank, fill in your name, do solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will henceforth faithfully support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the union of the states thereunder, and that I will in like manner abide by and faithfully support all acts of Congress passed during the existing rebellion with reference to slaves. Now it goes on. So, what Lincoln wanted us to do was not only to bind ourselves to the Constitution, which, by the way, all Southerners wanted anyhow was the Constitution, and it uh, applied the way it should be applied to North and South equally. But he not only wanted that, he wanted us also to swear allegiance to every act that Congress passed. You've got to remember that during those four years of the war, we had no representatives in Congress. And for several years afterwards, we still had no representatives in Congress. And although the 14th Amendment was passed unlawfully, yet he is saying now you've got to swear allegiance that you're going to uphold it. Well, there were other oaths as well that would bind Southerners And would effectually lock them out of any governmental office or position of authority. One of those oaths I've mentioned uh, earlier when I was dealing with Jesse James was the ironclad oath. And here's a portion of that oath. It went as follows. I blank do solemnly swear or affirm that I have never voluntarily borne arms against the United States since I've been a citizen thereof that I have voluntarily given no aid, countenance, counsel, or encouragement to persons engaged in armed hostility thereto. And if Southerners did not take this oath, 
They could either be shot or cut out of all political offices or offices of authority. You couldn't even preach. You couldn't teach. You couldn't do anything unless you took this ironclad oath in Missouri and in Kansas and in those areas like that. Now, when you and I think about allegiance, and we say, I pledge allegiance, when we think about allegiance... We have to admit there is a natural allegiance that is owed to your own country. But a natural allegiance is different from an express allegiance. A natural allegiance just simply comes from the fact that you're born in a country with a people, with a community, with traditions, with a language. But an express allegiance is not demanded. You put yourself under express allegiance by making a promise or making an oath or an obligation. That is what you do when you say, I pledge allegiance. And by the way, there is a difference between allegiance to one's country and allegiance to one's government. Now, it is wonderful when both are possible at the same time. It is wonderful when you can have allegiance to your country and your government. However, when your government becomes unlawful and unconstitutional and seeks to destroy the country, your first allegiance, naturally, is to your country and not your government. John Locke. In his second treatise on government, chapter 19, paragraph 222, said this. Listen carefully. Whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war with the people who are thereupon absolved from any further obedience, end quote. So John Locke, in his treatise on government, says that when government then becomes tyrannical and oppressive and begins to steal from the people, then the government is putting itself in a state of war against the people. And the people are thereby absolved from any allegiance to that government or any obedience to that government. To show you how times have changed... In 1918, President Theodore Roosevelt said this. To announce that there must be no criticism of the president or that we're to stand by the president right or wrong is not only unpatriotic but servile and servile but is morally treasonable to the American public, end quote. Can you imagine George Bush saying that today? To announce that there must be no criticism of the president or that we're to stand by the president right or wrong. Remember what he said about the war in Iraq? You're either what? For us or against us? To stand by the president right or wrong is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonable to the American public. That was the president of the United States who said that in 1918. And if you have difficulty with this, I would suggest that you take my book on Romans 13 and especially read the second chapter on the covenantal nature of government because I make this point exceedingly clear. Our allegiance is not due to a government that is reducing its citizens to slavery and subjecting them to tyranny. Let's go further. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Let me ask a question. What is a flag? Well, you say, Pastor, it's a symbol. I would agree with that. But the question must be asked, what does it symbolize? Another legitimate question is this. Has the symbolization changed? Now, the word flag does not occur in our Bibles. But the words banner, standard, and ensign do. And a banner and a standard and an ensign is the same as a flag. Psalm 60 and verse 4 says to God, 
Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of thy truth. So what has God done? God has given us a banner to those of us who fear him. He's given us a flag that that flag may be displayed because of the truth. One of my favorite verses is found in Isaiah 59 in verse 19. It has reference to the Holy Spirit. And it says this. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What is the spirit of the Lord doing? He's lifting up a standard. He's lifting up a battle flag against the enemy. What is our flag really supposed to represent, biblically speaking? Well, it's really supposed to represent truth, righteousness, and a willingness to fight against ungodliness and wickedness. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further in just a moment, but let's consider this phrase. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Another important question that must be asked is this. If you're going to pledge allegiance to the United States of America, which United States are you pledging allegiance to? Now, that's a legitimate question. Are we pledging allegiance to the original United States that were formed under the Articles of Confederation and later on the Constitution, or are we referring to the corporate United States that resides in the District of Columbia? And believe me, there's a difference. Now, prior to the War of Northern Aggression, Americans usually referred to these United States. After the war, it became the United States. Whereas before it was plural, now it became singular in one sense of the word. And whereas before it was little U and little s, now it becomes capital U and capital S. Now ask yourself, if you say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Are you pledging allegiance to a symbol of freedom and to the organic states that were brought together under the Constitution? Or are you pledging allegiance to a centralized bureaucracy that resides in the District of Columbia? Which United States do you mean? Now, I can assure you, I know which United States Francis Bellamy meant when he wrote it. Because I'm going to give you the quote again in just a moment. But I asked another question earlier, and that was this. Can a symbol change its meaning? And the answer is yes. The symbol may remain the same, but the principles which the symbol represents may change. I know most of you have never heard of Pastor Isaac Handy. He was a Baptist pastor. And he spent 15 months in Fort Delaware, New Jersey, prison, for a statement that he made concerning the symbolism of the flag. Now, Pastor Isaac Handy was a southerner who had married a woman from New Jersey. But her parents were southern sympathizers. Well, Pastor Handy and his wife went to New Jersey to visit her family. And uh, they had a number of family members there and some friends around. One of the men who was invited was Reverend Mr. Gaylord, who was the pastor of the Port Penn Church. Well, since he was in the home of Handy's in-laws, and most people there were southern sympathizers... And uh, everything was spoken rather freely there. Uh, something came up regarding the flag. And Pastor Handy said that he could no longer venerate that flag now as he had once. But now it was nothing more than an old rag. No longer representing the union 
or the principles which he believed in. Well, Pastor Gaylord then challenged Pastor Handy concerning his statement. And Pastor Handy said this. Listen carefully. Here's what he said concerning the flag of the United States of America. He said, and I quote, I venerated that flag too, sir, when it represented the Constitution and proclaimed equal rights protecting alike the North and the South. But that, sir, is no longer the flag of the Union. It is not the old flag. The symbols are the same, but the principles have changed. What is the flag irrespective of its principles? It is simply a painted rag. That flag once represented high and noble principles. I venerated those principles. And I love the old ensign because of the principles. But what means those stars and stripes today? Not certainly what they once meant. Now when I look upon a United States flag, I think I see written upon its broad folds, abolition, coercion, downtrodden constitution, oppression, tyranny. Those are not my principles. And I have no respect for any flag representing such enormities. End quote. Pastor Gaylord went and reported Pastor Handy, testified against him, and on July the 20th, 1863, he was sentenced to 15 months in a federal prison because he would not venerate the flag. Why would he not venerate it? He said the symbol is the same, but the principles have changed. Do you realize we have the same symbol today? We've had that same symbol for many, many years. But the symbol no longer stands for what it used to stand. Symbols may remain the same while the principles change. The principles that symbol represent may change dramatically. I will guarantee you that most of you that hear my voice, do not even know the original meaning of the United States flag. I'm going to tell you the real nature of the United States flag in the words of General and President George Washington. Here's what George Washington said. We take the stars from heaven the red from our mother country, separating it by white stripes, thus showing that we have separated from her, and the white stripes shall go down in posterity, representing liberty. So according to George Washington, thus the flag really and truly represents liberty under God. The stars from heaven. The red from our mother country, the white separating it, meaning liberty, meaning we've separated from them under the stars, under heaven, under God, we have liberty. Let me put it out very pointedly. The flag did not represent, nor has it ever represented, a sovereign government that simply took the place of the king and ruled over the states. When you pledge allegiance to the flag, you've got to ask yourself, what are the principles for which that symbol now stands? Let's go further. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Most of you know the story that when Ben Franklin stepped out of the Constitutional Convention, someone asked him, what kind of government have you given unto us? And his answer was, a republic, if you can keep it. A republic, if you can keep it. Now, there's a difference between the principle or, or between the republic that our founding fathers created and the republic that motivated and inspired and moved Bellamy to write the pledge. Now, our founding fathers established a republic. 
And Francis Bellamy used the word republic, but he does not mean by the word republic what our founding fathers meant. The French Republic, achieved by and through the French Revolution, has absolutely nothing in common with the American Republic that is guaranteed to us in the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, Paragraph 1, states this, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. That's in our Constitution. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Now, if you look up the word republic in most dictionaries, you're most likely to find this definition. A republic is a government of elected representatives. That may be true, but it is not all the truth, and it is a deliberate deception. A republic, in a governmental sense, is a government which the sovereignly held authority is held by and granted by the people, and the rule of government is according to law. Now, let me go further. Listen carefully. The Declaration of Independence states that the purpose of government is to protect the rights of the people. And that government does what? It derives its just powers from whom? The consent of the governed. Now, the first element in a republican form of government is that the power is derived from the people. The second element is that government itself operates within and under the control of law. In other words, a republic, and in a republic, the people are the masters, and the government is the servant. The people are on top, and the government is on the bottom. To put it another way, the people are the head, and the government is the tail. The Constitution, listen carefully now, the Constitution of the United States is a grant of authority from we the people to form a government. And the government that was thus formed by the Constitution was a limited government operating on authority granted from we the people. In every sense, it meets the earlier historical definition of republic The Constitution is the grant of authority from we the people for the government to act. The Constitution then, listen carefully, the Constitution is the law of the people for the control of government. The Constitution was never meant to bind the states nor to bind the people. It was meant to bind the federal government. When we say a republic, what our founding fathers meant is this, that in a republic the power is derived from the people, and when the people give the government that law, the only thing the government can do is act according to that law and under that law. Period. I got news for you folks. There is a difference as well between a republic and a democracy, and our politicians need to know that. They apparently do not understand the distinction. There's a vast difference. Listen to what James Madison, by the way, James Madison is known as the father of the Constitution because he was secretary at the Constitutional Convention. So if anybody should know, it should be James Madison who took all the notes. Here's what he said in the Federalist Paper number 10. Hence, it is such that democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, have been in general as short in their lives as they've been in, as violent in their deaths, end quote. Did James Madison say that we have given Americans a democracy? No. He said democracies are known for stealing the rights and the property of the people. 
what's happening in our democracy today. See, we've changed our constitutional republic to a democracy. That's why the Supreme Court judges can rule that in eminent domain, why, the cities and towns can do whatever they want to do. We have no property. It's all theirs. And that's why you pay a tax to use their property. You pay the rent. And James Madison says you cannot have freedom in a democracy. This may shock you, but I'm going to read it to you. This is directly from the United States Army Training Manual from 1928. Democracy. Quote, a democracy of the masses, authority derived through mass meetings or any form of direct expression, results in mobocracy. Attitude toward property is communistic, negating property rights. Attitude toward law is that the will of the majority shall regulate, whether it be based upon deliberation or governed by passion, prejudice, and impulse without restraint or regard to consequences. Results in demagogism, license, agitation, discontent, and anarchy, end quote. That's from the United States Army Manual in 1928. Our constitutional fathers certainly were familiar with the differences between a republic and a democracy. And they were understandably knowledgeable in the difference between an autocracy and a democracy. And when they gave us a republic, they did so with certain fixed principles in mind, and they defined a republic, as I've already given it to you, and it's very marked from a democracy. And repeatedly, they said they had given us a republic. Now, we could go further and say this, because remember now, the Constitution of the United States guarantees to every state a republican form of government. How can the United States, how can the federal government guarantee to every state a republican form of government? Here's why. Because each state in the Union that met at the Constitutional Convention and agreed to form the federal government was a sovereign, independent state. And listen, the federal government, therefore, is an association of small republics. And therefore, it was to guarantee that each one would continue as a republican form of government. Do you remember when Robert E. Lee refused command of the Union Army and resigned his commission in 1861? He told the commanding general of the army, Winfield Scott, that he was refusing the command of the Union Army and he was resigning his commission. Why? Here's why. Because he said, I cannot raise my sword against my own country. What was his country? Virginia. What was his state? Virginia. And Winfield Scott understood. He understood because Virginia was his country, it was his state, it was his republic. They understood what was meant by then. And the United States government or the federal government was set up to mirror the republican form of government in the states. That every state would be ruled by the consent of the people, by law, by a constitution. And that constitution would even bind down the state governments. And that's why we did it to the federal government, to bind them down. Let's go further. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the public for which it stands, one nation under God. Huh. One nation. Now, the truth is, we do not understand terms the way our forefathers did. One of the first things we need to learn to do is to define our terms. Think of the word nation. And what do you think about when you hear the word nation? 
What does it mean? If you're going to swear allegiance to the nation, what are you swearing allegiance to? Let me give you two definitions. You will find these two definitions in Black's Law Dictionary. They're probably Bouvier's as well. But I just took them out of Black's. Listen to the Black's definition of, pe- uh, of nation. Here it is. Here's the first definition. A people or aggregation of men existing in the form of an organized general society, usually inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth, speaking the same language, using the same customs, possessing historic continuity, and distinguished from other like groups by their racial origin and characteristics, and generally, but not necessarily, living under the same government and sovereignty. Now, now let's just stop there. I want you to think about that definition. That's not a bad definition. What did he say is the first definition of a nation? It's a group of people living under an organized jural society, that is, you have a law, usually inhabiting a certain distinct portion of the earth. You speak the same language, not 40. You have the same customs, not 40. You have a historic continuity. And you're distinct from other racial groups. And you normally live under the same government. We understand that. We have no problem with that. But listen to the second definition. In American constitutional law, the word state is applied to the several members of the American Union, while the word nation is applied to the whole body of people embraced within the jurisdiction of the federal government. Did you hear that? Embraced within the jurisdiction of... Of the federal government. All I can say is my how times have changed. Do you remember that originally the government which was created by the states was to be the servant of the states. The states were the masters and the government was the servant. Now the bottom rail is on top. And our nation is described as the whole body of people within the jurisdiction of the federal government. Let me ask you one question. Is it right to pledge allegiance to usurped or stolen authority? How did the federal government get where it is today? I will tell you, it stole authority that was never given to it by the states or by the people. Certainly, we should be loyal to our country. We should be loyal to our people. We should be loyal to our way of life. But not to a usurped authority that denies everything for which the people stand. Kirk Tofty, who is a financial manager in Des Moines, Iowa, wrote this. Listen carefully. He hit the nail on the head. He said, nationalism is the worship of a nation state. As a civil religion, it is a false faith. It represents chasing after idols. When nationalism is used to mask militarism and imperialism, it is worse than a false faith. It is the gravest of sins that only a, that can only be forgiven by a truly loving God. So what is he saying about today? Nationalism is a mask for militarism and imperialism. One does not need to bow down to a graven idol in order to be an idolater. You've got to remember that idolatry begins in the mind, and it often stays there. Unbiblical and ungodly thinking and wrong attitudes are just as idolatrous as bowing down to graven images. Let's go further. Uh, he said, One nation under God. 
What is meant by that phrase under God? Remember now, that phrase was not put in until 1954. If the phrase under God means under God's sovereign authority and law, I would concede that's exactly where we need to be as people, as a country. But let me read to you an article. This article was from the Commercial Appeal in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's on Francis Bellamy and his great-grandson. Here's what it says. Descendants of the man who authored the Pledge of Allegiance says he probably wouldn't mind the removal of the words under God because he wouldn't have wanted them added in the first place. Scott Bellamy, 49, who owns a sandwich shop in Memphis suburb, says his great-grandfather, Francis Bellamy, a socialist editor and Baptist minister, had clear reasons behind every word of the original pledge he wrote in 1892. Francis Bellamy protested even the addition of the United States of America on Flag Day in 1924, believing the pledge as he wrote it did not need changing. If he didn't want the United States of America in the pledge, he wouldn't have wanted under God either, said Scott Bellamy, who told the Commercial Appeal of Memphis. Wednesday, the Federal Appeals Court in California found reciting the pledge at public schools was unconstitutional because the words under God inserted by Congress in 1954 amounted to a government endorsement of religion. The ruling ignited a storm of criticism and was put on hold. Shortly before his death in 1931, Francis Bellamy wrote a letter to his 10-year-old grandson, Scott Bellamy's father, explaining how he wrote the pledge originally for school children. He said that in 1892, he was an associate editor of the Youth's Companion magazine and was chosen to prepare an official program to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in America. End quote. So the descendants of Francis Bellamy said they don't want under God in there either because their father wouldn't have under wanted it under God in there. Now, John Bear, and I told you his book was very significant because Bear is the one who wrote uh, the centennial history of the Pledge of Allegiance from 1892 to 1992. He has some question and answers. And I want you to listen to the question and the answer. Get ready for this now. The question is to Mr. Bear. What would have been the opinions of Reverend Francis Bellamy, the author of the pledge, and James Madison, father of the United States Constitution, about the June 26, 2002, Ninth U.S. Circuit Court ruling, that is Michael Newdow versus the Congress, the United States Congress, that when they said the words under God were unconstitutional. So, I'm not concerned about James Madison right now. I am concerned about the response to Francis Bellamy. Here is his answer. And I would say that John Bear is probably the foremost authority on the pledge that is alive today. But here's his answer to that question. What would Francis Bellamy think of the Ninth Circuit Court's ruling that under God is unconstitutional? Here's his answer. Reverend Francis Bellamy, 1855 to 1931, probably would be happy with this decision. When Bellamy wrote the pledge in August 1892, he never considered placing the words under God in his original version of the Pledge of Allegiance. In 1954, David Bellamy, the son, sent a message to Congress politely stating that his father would not like the addition by Congress. His granddaughter and his great-granddaughter have made similar statements. Francis Bellamy was probably a Christian deist he did not believe in the virgin birth, the resurrection, or the ascension of Jesus Christ. He stopped attending church during his retirement in Florida. His father, Reverend David Bellamy, was more orthodox. In 1847, David Bellamy founded the Calvary Baptist Church, now located at 123rd West 57th Street in New York City. Next door is the New York Bible School, John Bear. Did you hear what he said? Francis Bellamy would not want under God under there. Why? He did not believe in the virgin birth. He did not believe in the resurrection. He did not believe in the ascension of Jesus Christ. He was a deist. He was an unbeliever. He thought that, yeah, there may be a God somewhere up there, but he's just kind of wound up the clock of the universe and letting everything run down. There's no intervention of God. There's no miracles. There's no concern. Wow. Certainly no Christian and hopefully no southerner 
would ever have, ever have any problem with acknowledging the sovereignty and the supremacy and the ultimacy of the one true and the living God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. But the problem that you have with this statement, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Here's my question. Which God? Who's God? If we are indeed under God, the one true and the living God, as a people, what does that mean? It means we're to obey His law, we're to keep His word, we're to honor His statutes. However, what we've done is we've become so accustomed to saying words, we do not even understand what they mean. And I've got news for you. Every Muslim could repeat that phrase under God and there'd be no problem. My Hindu would be no problem. If I'm going to acknowledge that I'm under God, I want to, everyone to know the God that I'm talking about is the God and Father of Jesus Christ, the only true and living God. Listen to what he says. Now listen, we're, we're, we're just analyzing the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the public for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Indivisible. One of my main contentions with the pledge is this word, indivisible. Because the word indivisible is a denial of history, of fact, and of plain truths. Listen to what Francis Bellamy said. Here are his own words. That phrase encompassed our struggle for independence and for indivisibility, which the Civil War was required to fully prove. Might does not make right. And the simple fact that the South lost the war of northern aggression does not change the truth. It does not change history and it does not change facts. The truth is every state acceded to the Constitution and every state reserved to itself and kept to itself the right to secede from the Constitution. You see, when George III made peace with the American colonies... In 1783, the Treaty of Paris. He did not make peace with just a United States government. No. Here's what it says, the opening words. His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States viz. And then names the 13 states to be free and independent states. George III made peace with 13 independent sovereign states. The second article in the Articles of Confederation clearly state this. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence in every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States. So when the Articles of Confederation was written, every state was free, sovereign, and independent. Virginia... When she acceded to the Constitution on June the 25th, 1788, said this. They said, we're going to ratify the Constitution, but here's the reservation. Listen carefully. The powers granted under the Constitution being derived from the people of the United States may be resumed by them. Whensoever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression, that every power not granted thereby remains with them at their will. What did Virginia say? Uh, we're going to ratify the Constitution, but we want everybody to understand that when tyranny and oppression comes along, we have the absolute right to take back what we gave the federal government. By the way, it wasn't just Virginia, because New York, on July the 26th, 1788, when she ratified the Constitution, said this, that the powers of government may be resumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary to their happiness. New York also said, we're going to take it back whenever we want it. Do you realize when the Constitution was being ratified, only 11 of the original 13 states ratified it. North Carolina and Rhode Island did not ratify the Constitution right away. In fact, it was over a year later before they ever ratified the Constitution. And by the way, there was no war 
fought against Rhode Island, North Carolina to save the Union. And I want you to note something. What the majority of states did did not affect the other states. We couldn't come along and say, well, 11 out of 13 voted for it. That means the other two got to take it. No, 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 no. Every state was free, sovereign, and independent. And when over a year later, both North Carolina and Rhode Island did ratify the Constitution, Rhode Island came out with this reservation. They said, we, the delegates of the people of Rhode Island and plantations duly elected, do declare and make known that the powers of government may be resumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary to their happiness. Now, here are three states that dogmatically asserted the right to secede every state had that right, every state believed they had that right, or they would have never ratified the Constitution to begin with. Thus, when one says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, you're pledging allegiance to a lie because the plain fact of history is Originally, it was divisible. If you have the right to accede, you also have the right to secede. Now, it's not my intention to deal today with the biblical doctrine of secession. I've done that before. But let me tell you something. You can say indivisible all you want to today. But the truth of the matter is our nation is divided in a multitude of ways today. Economically, politically culturally, linguistically, ethnically, all kinds of ways. There is no way in the world that we have an indivisible nation today. It's not true historically, and it's certainly not true practically. And then the pledge says, with liberty and justice for all. Now, Bellamy's idea of liberty and justice for all is found in the 14th, 15th, and 16th Amendments to the Constitution, which were really, when he said, with liberty and justice of all, he really wanted to use his French Revolution slogan, liberty, equality, and fraternity, which he was unable to do so. But I've got news for you folks. If you depend on the 14th Amendment for your justice... Excuse my English, but you ain't got any. Same thing with the 15th and same thing with the 16th. Francis Bellamy, as a Christian socialist, that's what he called himself, in conjunction with many other liberal thinkers and writers of his day, favored a socialistic, centralized federal government as opposed to the traditional conservative Christianity and the local government concepts of the South. He, along with his cousins, and especially Edward Bellamy, became the heroes of John Dewey and others who advocated progressive revelation or progressive education, which in a hundred years has produced in our country a morally corrupt, anti-Christian, multicultural, secular public school system, which now openly opposes Christianity, parents, and morality. That's a fact. And by the way, when you say with liberty and justice for all, may I point out, there is no liberty and there is no justice apart from God and His law. What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7, 17? Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And what did our Lord say in John 8, 36? If the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. But without Him, there is no liberty, there is no freedom, there is no justice. You cannot have justice apart from God and His law. And you want to know another thing wrong with our country? The judicial system. And let me tell you something. When you let murderers go and rapists go and kidnappers go, and when you do not execute those whom God demands... To be put to death, let me tell you, God has it fixed up where either the the murderer is put to death or society dies, one or the other. You cannot have justice apart from God and His law. Now, let me just make some very quick applications. The first one is this. 
Am I going to get mad with you because you recite the pledge? No. I'm not going to get mad at you. But I think this. I think if you're going to recite the pledge, you ought to know what you mean. And you ought to know what Francis Bellamy meant. And you better determine what meaning you're going to give to those words. And what concepts you're going to give to those words. You may exercise your liberty to say the pledge, or you may exercise your liberty not to say the pledge. But I'm going to tell you one thing. You flat better understand the aim and the intent of that pledge. And Francis Bellamy did not hide it. He said point blank, he was going to elevate, he wanted to elevate the state. He wanted a socialistic, fascist, controlled government that dictated every area of our lives. Our founding fathers never, ever envisioned the kind of republic that Francis Bellamy envisioned. Their definition of republic and his definition of republic are two totally different things. And may I point out, this was one of the issues of the War of Northern Aggression. The South had one interpretation of republic and one interpretation of the Constitution. And the North had a completely different interpretation of a, a republican constitution. Do you realize the problem that we're having today with a gargantuan government is the same problem? Because we have different ideas as to what a republic really, truly is. And certainly I hope you can see that government can become a god. Not in truth and reality. But when you and I begin to ascribe to government power and authority over and above that and beyond that which the word of God gives, that is indeed idolatry. And God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when you look to government instead of God, you are an idolater. Pure and simple. You know what our Lord said? And by the way, I hope you know that as Christians, our first, our full, and our final allegiance must be to Jesus Christ. Our Lord said in Matthew 10 and verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We may owe a duty to man and to government. But first and full and final allegiance is only owed to the one true and the living God. Ray Bolts wrote these words. Many of you have heard this song many times. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Hear the words. I have heard how Christians long ago were brought before a tyrant's throne and they were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name of Christ. But one by one they chose to die. The Son of God they would not deny. Like a great angelic choir sings, I can almost hear their voices ring. I pledge allegiance to the flat Lamb with all my strength, with all I am. I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Now the years have come and the years have gone. But the cause of Jesus still goes on. And now our time has come to count the cost. To reject this world. To embrace the cross. And one by ones to let, life, let us live our lives for the one who died to give us life. Till the trumpet sounds on the final day, let us proudly stand and boldly say, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength, with all I am. I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. To the Lamb who bore my pain, who took away, or who took my place, who wore my shame. I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. If we give our allegiance to Christ, I can assure you, we will not be wrong. If you have your duty to God down first, your duty to man will automatically fall in place. But if you put man first, 
you're going to be wrong every which way you turn. We must remember, as Christians, our first, full, and final allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Why? He's God of gods and King of kings and Lord of lords. And as Scripture says, He only is worthy of all honor and all praise and all glory. Let's pray. Father, we ask today that You help us. Give us understanding. Quicken our minds. May we be able to think things through and to think them through biblically and scripturally. Give us grace, Lord to serve thee acceptably with reverence and godly fear, and to put thee first in every area of our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen.